My name is Don Tao. I will serve as your host for tonight's program. Tonight's program is on Chinese American experience in the United States, 20th and 21st centuries. As we discussed in the last two weeks, the most important question facing the world today is whether our world is moving toward war or moving toward peace. Since the United States and China are the two most powerful countries in the world, the relationship between the United States and China is key to the question, are we, are we moving toward war or moving toward peace? Unfortunately, the Western mass media and the United States government are now on a program to demonize China. However, their accusations are not based on truth, but mostly on fabrications. But there are dangerous implications for these fabricated accusations. They increase tension between the United States and China and result in serious consequences, which are not good not only for Chinese Americans, but also not good for Americans in general, and also not good for all the citizens of the world. The end result is that crit critical resources will be allocated to the military, military and wars, instead of using those valuable resources to improve our economy, rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, to work on global problems like climate change, pandemic, terrorism, poverty, illiteracy, discrimination, and fight against war and promote peace. Therefore, this demonization of China must not be left unchallenged. Otherwise, we will never achieve our objective of moving the world toward peace. That's why we are organizing a series of educational webinars to help people understand that such demonization of China is not based on truth. And even more importantly, they are not good for Americans and also not good for all the people of the world. To understand current US-China relationship, we need to understand the historical relationship between United States and China and the evolution of that relationship and how the world has changed in the past 50 years or so. To understand the historical development of United States-China relationship, we also need to understand how China was treated by the foreign powers, including the United States. Therefore, we need to discuss modern Chinese history. How China is treated by the United States is very much related to how Chinese Americans are treated in the United States. And therefore, we also need to discuss the experience of Chinese Americans in the United States. That's why this series of webinars revolve around the three topics, Chinese American experience in the United States, modern Chinese history, and US-China relationship. We hope that these educational webinars will help people understand why we should not rely on war to solve our differences. Instead, the world's two most powerful countries should be working cooperatively on a win-win approach to improve the whole world, rather than destroying the world for our children and grandchildren. We hope that you'll join these peace-promoting organizations like our co-sponsors to keep move the world toward peace. Thank you. Now we will start tonight's program on the topic of Chinese American experience in the United States for the 20th and 21st centuries. Okay. Uh, but before I do that, I want to mention that we are two speakers to, tonight and the session will be chaired by Judge Lian Singh. Lilian is gonna say a few words about tonight's program and then she will introduce the two speakers. Before I hand the floor over to Lilian, let me say a few words about Lilian. Lillian is the first Asian American female judge in Northern California. She's a co-founder 
of rape and nanking religious coalition, the Comfort Women Justice Coalition, and the Chinese for Affirmative Action. Lillian, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Good afternoon to the Californians and good evening to New Yorkers and wherever you are around the world. Thank you for joining us. I'm really delighted and honored to be here tonight and today. You are in for a real good treat. We have two of the most renowned experts in the area of Asian American studies. And like Don said, in order to understand today, you need to know about the past. You know, a very important philosopher, George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Unfortunately, our leaders, our government, and those who make decisions on our behalf, either towards peace or towards war, has not learned from the past and from history. That's why we need to focus on the past over and over again to teach the past and hopefully the present people will learn about our past and not commit the same mistake. The topic tonight is really important. And we have two professors and usually professors are boring lecturers, but I can assure you tonight's professors are anything but that. I first will introduce Professor Russell John to you. Professor Russell John is with the Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. He is an author of books and articles on race and religion. He's written Family Sacrifices, The World Views and Ethics of Chinese Americans, Oxford Press, Mountain Movers, Student Activism and Emergence of Asian American Studies, At Home and Exile. I think that is probably what is most relevant for tonight's program. Finding Jesus among my ancestors and refugee neighbors. This year, actually in March, 2020, Dr. Jen co-founded Stop AAPI Hates with Chinese for Affirmative Action and the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. It tracks incidents of COVID-19 discrimination to develop policy interventions and long-term solutions to racism. Dr. Zhang has really made it. He is selected by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 influential persons of 2021. And I don't know of anyone else the, except the co-founders of AAPI Hate Organization who have been selected but social from the community, I'm talking, social activists, uh, to be one of the top 100 influential persons of, by Time Magazine. He was also awarded the 2021 Webby Award for Social Movement of the Year. So Dr. Zhang, we're so pleased to be in your presence. You are <laughs> someone that now I can say I know him. Now I'm gonna do uh, Professor Ling Chi Wang. This is a hard one because I've known Ling Chi for over 50 years, five decades. So I don't even know where to start to introduce Professor Ling Chi Wang. I can tell you from personal experience and from all the work that he's done, he is probably one of the most brilliant persons I know and many other people know. He's like a walking encyclopedia and can tell you anything you wanna know about anything, not only about Chinese American history, global and local politics, but also about wine, pop, operas, and movies. I bet very few of you know that Ling Chi is a wine connoisseur and loves movies, especially film noir. Unlike some of you may think, Ling Chi is really quite sociable and loves to eat, drink, and be merry. So we're gonna have a good time with Ling Chi tonight. But what I admire the most about Ling Chi is his unwavering passion to help Chinese Americans fight for justice. We all know he started the UCB's Ethnic and Asian American Studies, taught his first ethnic studies class 
and chaired the Department of Ethnic Studies. But some of you may not know that his impact at UCB goes way beyond the classrooms and the Ethnic Studies Department. In the late 70s, he observed a disproportionate drop of Asian Americans at UCB. Yes, a drop in enrollment. And he sensed that UCB's admission policies may be setting a ceiling of Asian American enrollment. So he formed the Asian American Task Force on UCB admissions to study the effects of admission policies on Asian enrollment. He inspired and persuaded Judge Ken Kawaiichi and myself to co-chair the committee. After five years of in intensive investigation, we successfully got Chancellor Ira Heyman to publicly apologize for UCB's adverse admission policies and he was able to push the college board to develop SAT uh, scholastic achievement tests for Asian languages. Before that, you could take a test for Hebrew, but not for Asian languages, not for Chinese. So today, if you walk on UCB campus, you may never know that these issues exist. But it was because of Ling Chi's advocacies that we had the kind of Asian Americans enrollment at UCB. Now, Ling Chi's vision to promote the rights of linguistic minorities, bilingual education for immigrant students across the United States go way beyond what we know about him. He was also instrumental in working with a very brilliant lawyer, S. Diamond, to bring about a landmark case called Lau versus Nichols. Lau versus Nichols was a unanimous decision by the United States Supreme Court, at which held that the California school must provide bilingual education to help non-native English speaking students. In our legal community, Lau versus Nichols is as much a landmark decision as Brown versus Board of Education, which held that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. No. Therefore, for us, Lau versus Nichols is just as important for all the immigrants who come to the United States to learn English. So I want to publicly thank Ling Chi Wang for doing that. Ling Chi has received numerous awards and lifetime achievements, certificates of all kinds, and I don't have time to mention them here. But Ling Chi, you've got to be yeah, we've got to work harder to get your name also recognized by Time Magazine. <laughs> but, you know, most of the mainstream media would not recognize someone like you or me or Judge Julie Tang. But because of Russell Young and CAA's great work in Stop Asian, Anti-Asian Hate Violence, now Time Magazine is finally getting onto the bandwagon and starting to recognize some of us. So Ling Chi, I hope to see you be recognized as men of the year. And also maybe one day, like Fred Karamatsu, we'll have a California day for Ling Chi Wang. All right, I've, I've said enough places for Ling Chi and I think I've embarrassed him greatly. However, I have the prerogative of doing that because I've known him so long and I'm the godmother of his youngest daughter, Wei Ying. Now let's go back to the program at large. Today, we're gonna to have two sections. Ling Chi will start with talking about the past, mostly about uh, the Wen Ho Lee case, the Makatism of the 1950s, and, the, and then followed by Russell Jung on the recent anti-Asian American hate violence cases and what we should do about them. Ling Chi. That was way too generous. And certainly, I do not deserve all that, uh, you know, positive uh, comments because, uh, you know, what I have done could not have been done without a lot of people, uh, you know, involved. And uh, I see myself more or less as a facilitator. And, uh, but let me go on to tonight's topic. You know, it's a very tall order to talk about you know, Chinese American experience in the 20th and 21st century. In the last session, two weeks ago, I talked about 
the uh, you know essentially Chinese experience in the 19th century. And that experience was mostly of the, uh, of the working class people who came to the United States to do all the dirty work that needed to be done in order to develop California to what it is today. And I had suggested that the Chinese labor was really the most indispensable factor in the development of what California is today toward the end of 19th century, not only in uh, gold rush and, and other, by the way, other uh, mining activities throughout California and the West, but also of course the transcontinental railroad construction and subsequently all the railroad networks, the Southern route, the Northern route, uh, Canadian transnational, uh, trans transcontinental route. You know, they were all, you know, really, I think we are what we are today. Essentially, we built our, you know, we built on the back of the Chinese working class people. They were nameless and faceless, but nevertheless, their contribution was indispensable. And yet, the reward for their contributions was, of course, the enactment of Chinese exclusion law beginning in 1882. Most people think of 1882 as if it was the only exclusion law, but actually after that Congress enacted another 14 Chinese exclusion laws to pluck up all the loopholes and to make sure that Chinese, those who were here will remain discriminated and miserable and so intolerable that they will eventually go back. And that's why one of the Chinese commentators at that time suggested that, you know, this is not exclusion. This is really extermination because the Chinese populations, unlike most immigrants, from well, one generation, their numbers increased. The Chinese immigration, a uh, Chinese population figure actually went the opposite way. From 1882 on, they were dived and, uh, to from, from about 100, uh, a little bit over 100,000 to about 60, 70,000 in the first two decades of the 20th centuries. And that's why there's that, you know, that exclusion. And those exclusion laws, thank God, finally repealed in 1943. At the height of the uh, Second World War, President Roosevelt needed China to help defeat Japan. And, uh, but Roosevelt wanted to defeat the German first in Europe. So his policy was Europe first, Asia second. And therefore he, wait, you know, he, he put all the weight on engaging Japan, wearing them down in China. And, uh, but the Japanese were very clever. They used the Chinese exclusion laws of 15 exclusion laws to drop leafless broadcast radio all throughout China to undermine the morale of the Chinese soldier and told, and told the Chinese, why are you fighting for the Americans? You should be fighting with us because we are Asia, Asians for, you know, Asia for Asians, not Asian for Americans. And, uh, and that prompted President Roosevelt and Congress to quickly on a fast track to try to repeal the Chinese, those 15 exclusion law, which he finally succeeded in 1943. But did that really open the door for Chinese to come into the United States? Not at all. Congress did not want to open the door at all. In fact, you know, they did not want to open the floodgate and invite what they call yellow peril. And so, Congress did a very clever thing that we will only admit one tenth of 1% of Chinese, the number of Chinese based on 1890 census, which turned out to be 105 a year. And that's how 105 Chinese began to be admitted at a time when over 90% of the Chinese population were only the working male, you know, aging, 
working male. And uh, so it's really quite unfortunate that, but the exclusion continue, by the way, did not really finally repeal until 1965 immigration law. So it's hard to cover the 20th century, um, but I think it's important to, to note that the exclusion law got repealed during the height of US-China friendship. America needed China to help defeat the Japanese. And we enacted the, the, uh, the repeal law, um, but no sooner was the war, had the war ended, China entered into a five-year civil war from 1945 to, well, from 1945 to 1949. And it was a fight between two giants of the 20th century, Chiang Kai-shek of the Kuomintang Nationalist Party and the, the ruling party of China, and, you know, Chairman Mao Zedong, the Chinese Communist Party, which by the way, had just celebrated, you know, its uh, 100th anniversary. And uh, the, uh, that war, even though Chiang Kai-shek's army numbers in millions had the best equipment and uh, tanks and everything supplied by the United States was very quickly defeated um, by a group of soldiers who really, you know, have, you know uh, very poor and, uh, and yet very determined and also had the popular support and that's why as soon as the war was over, Chiang Kai-shek's government collapsed very, very fast. And by 1949, Mao took over China. And very quickly overnight, from being the friend of the United States, China became the number one enemy of the United States. And we devised a policy called containment of China by military, economic, and political means. And we meant that trade embargo, you know, we were willing to sacrifice trade uh, with China and to try to prevent, uh, to, to cause the collapse of China. And China, of course, did not collapse. Um, in fact, it's still going very strong. And, uh, and that, by the way, they given rise, of course, to the idea that the rise of China for the United States means the threat of China. And the state that we are now in is precisely that. But let me go back to uh, the history. 20th century uh, Chinese American immigrant that eventually came in, especially after 1965, were not the peasants and the working class people predominantly like the 19th century but actually were very well educated. Now, last time when I talk here, I suggested that American foreign policy was based on two very important uh, missions. One is of course, trade with China has always been and will continue to be the most important trade partner of the United States, in spite of all that you know, hostility between the two. You know, China is still the number one trading partner of the United States. And uh, the other major objective of our foreign policy was to convert China by sending Christian missionaries, because we think that the best way to maintain a good relation with China was to convert Chinese heathenism into Christian, Chinese Christianity. And uh, but that policy did not go well at all. Um, and in fact, one of the first people to discover that was none other than the Reverend William Spear of a Presbyterian missionary sent to Canton in the, early, in the, in the first half of the 19th century. And while he was there, he got tuberculosis and almost killed him. He came back to, to, uh, to recuperate and he successfully recovered in those days, it was rare. And after he recovered, he told, told the Christian Presbyterian Church that, hey, instead of sending me back to China, why don't you send me to California? 
San Francisco in particular, because all the Chinese immigrants were coming in, you know, for the gold rush. And it's better to convert the Chinese in California and then to Christianity and then send them back to China so that they could help convert the rest of Chinese population to Christianity and also create the kind of government that we want the Chinese people have to have, like ours. Our type of government is what we want the Chinese to have. And that's, those are the two things, mission and trade. Continue from the founding fathers to this day to be the primary objectives of our, our foreign policy. Now, we of course no longer send missionary. We have the 20th and 21st century missionaries. And these are the people who, who preach human rights, who preach democracy, who preach freedom, who preach uh, organized labor, labor uh, environmental protection. All these are the 21st century American messages. Not that Chinese don't want those, you know, but they want to do it their own way. And why not? China have existed for over 4,000 years and they have their own way of doing things. Why should we, a new born country, and the whole history of the United States is actually shorter than the Qing Dynasty, the last dynasty uh, of, of the uh, Chinese, uh, you know, dynastic system before, you know, before Dr. Sun Yat-sen, you know, succeeded in overthrowing the Manchu uh, emperor. So, um, and but the missionaries there turned out not to be very successful they found out that it was more successful to build some hospitals and build some school and so that the Chinese will become better educated and become good Christians. And even that was not enough because you know, the Chinese population is over a billion. And uh, so they thought that one of the best way is to bring the Chinese students over from China, educate them in our school and train them and convert them into Christianity and send them back. And believe it or not, this particular model was very successful. It's been very successful since the, you know, since the 1970s in Taiwan. You know, Taiwan was ruled by Chiang Kai-shek and his son under dictatorship, but eventually the, you know, the dictatorship, the martial law got repealed and in place of the uh, dictators and the Chiang family, we now have, you know, if you look at the Taiwan president and their cabinet, almost most of them are American educated and educated in America. They think like Americans. And for the first time that our leader can say that we can pick up the phone and talk in English to the political leaders in Taiwan and tell them what we want. And, uh, and so, you know, so this is, now here's what I was going to, you know, in the, in the top topic for today, you notice that our host Dong Tao put in uh, people like, um, you know, Vincent Chen and uh, Wen Ho Li, um, you know, and most of the people he, he had mentioned before, although not by name, were actually educated in the United States. Vincent Chin came to the United States for education. Wen Ho Li graduated, born and raised and educated in Taiwan, came over to the United States and got his PhD in, uh, in uh, mechanical engineering and, uh, and then started working uh, initially uh, for Los Alamos. National Laboratory dealing with the most advanced weapon of the United States, multiple warhead uh, nuclear devices, and uh, you know, people like that. Um, now, but there is a long story behind the students who came to America. And in fact, one whole case came out when it first came out in appear on the New York Times in 1969. 19, sorry, in 1999, in, on the front page of the New York Times, uh, he was really, you know, not the only one. 
And in fact, he was very quickly compared certainly by me uh, to another Chinese scientist, uh, aeronautic engineer by the name of Chen Xiexin. Most of you, that name means nothing probably, but to, men, to all the Chinese in China, they know who he was. He was considered the father of Chinese rocketry. He, he came to the United States and went to school at MIT and then eventually got tenure by the way at MIT in one year and, and then you know, got his PhD from Caltech and uh, you know, very well known. And in fact, one of the foremost American rocket scientists in the, in, during the war. And uh, he was sent by our government to study successful German rockets attacking London. And uh, in fact, he even got sent to Germany to interview the German scientists, rocket scientists. So he was, a, well, to tell you how important he was to us. Professor, he, yes. Professor Lin Chi Wong, you have so many great stories and so no. interesting, but you. the problem is, it is, uh, we need okay. to leave some time for okay. uh, Professor Zhang. Yes. Come back to Wen Ho Li. Yes. Sorry. Why is this case about so that. Let me just quickly sum yes. up. Okay. Wen Ho Li was accused, like many Chinese scientists, of being, and including Chen Xie, Chen Xie in 1950, um, of being a spy, you know, possible spy for China. And of course, and but during the McCarthy era, Professor Chen was accused of being a, 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 a fellow tra traveler, a co communist sympathizer. And so even though he had military contracts with Army, Navy, and Air Force to develop rockets for them, he immediately lost his, um, his, all the contracts, put under house arrest for five years, and then eventually used to trade for about a dozen or so American POW from Korean War in 1955. And uh, he was able to do so because of a lawsuit filed by another Chinese scientist who came over to the United States, got his PhD in oceanography. And uh, he wanted to go back to China after 1949, after Mao took over China. And the United States, at that time, there were about four to 5,000 very prominent top tier Chinese scientists in the United States. Uh, they were studying, they were sent over by Chiang Kai-shek to study and then go back to help China modernize. Well, our government decided these, two, these people are too valuable to be sent back to China. And so they got retained along with the, this rocket scientist, Chen Xiexin. And, but uh, Mr. Hang An, um, no, Han Li, Mao Han Li, who, who sued because he wanted to go back and he successfully challenging American government's ability to retain them, even though they wanted to exclude Chinese to be at that time still. And yet they wanted they, and should be deported, but they would not let them go back. So he successfully challenged that uh, policy and he was eventually, he won. And as a result of that, we use Chen to negotiate for the three prisoner exchange with the POW on Korean War. So you could see that, you know, we have good ideas about allowing China to send a lot of people here to become trained by the United States and then send them back to gradually to change China. But the problem is that we always manage to shoot our own feet, just like what we are doing now with our dealings with China. We did that during the McCarthy era, put all the Chinese American <laughs> under suspicion. Being Chinese American became synonymous with espionage and treason. I think and that's a, lot a very of good point. Got harassed and deported because of that. And they use INS, use IRS, use CIA. Um, you know, it's just uh, tragic the way that we treated uh, the Chinese who came here, who were the cream of China, who were the backbone of America's superiority 
in science and technology in the second half of the 20th century. And now, you know, a lot of it because of the Chinese scientists. You know, there are 300. Professor, Professor Wong, I think studying. we need to save some time for Professor Jung. I think yes. there's a very good leading into what Professor Jung is going to talk about, which is American, uh, Chinese American scientists yes. and how okay. they are being treated today. Sorry, but I got on the Wen Wong Lee case, no, no, I think it's a really important case. And I just want to add that uh, Wen Hong Lee was put into solitary confinement for 278 days. And yeah. he was constantly shackled as if he was going to be such a danger to our country. Only one hour a day that he was free to walk. The right. Street. And so he yeah. was treated terribly. But in the end, the government only got one convict, uh, got one guilty plea from him, and that is, has nothing to do with espionage, has nothing to do with spying. And the judge actually apologized to uh, Wen Hongli. I want to say one thing about the judge, because I'm a judge, and sometimes we can let, be led astray. The judge said he was led astray by the Department of Justice, by the FBI, and by its United States attorney. So that's the problem in some of these court cases just like Fred Karamato's conviction, when Marilyn Patel granted his petition for quorum nobis because the government was uh, misled and was led astray. So Russell, maybe you can tell us now about how the government is leading astray, not only um, us, the public, but Biden, the administration, in bringing about this China initiative in charging all these Chinese scientists who are just as brilliant as the ones that Professor Lin Chi Wang just mentioned. And what, what are we doing to them? How are we treating them? And what does that effect do to our government and the US-China relationship? Professor Zhang? Hey, thanks, uh, Judge Singh. And thank you, Professor Wang, um, for giving us a history about the yellow peril fear. Uh, both workers were seen to threaten white workers' jobs, and now um, Chinese scientists are seen to be um, agents of espionage and threatening America by stealing um, national security secrets um, and um, technology secrets. So if we know our history, um, we're seeing history repeat itself, like Judge Singh um, just said right now. Even today in 2021, the exact same pattern is continuing. And I'm gonna explain quickly in maybe seven minutes of what's happening um, currently where we see history repeating itself. So I'll just um, share a screen here. Um, in the last two sessions, we've learned about the consequences of the yellow peril and um, how that's led to anti-Asian hate. And for me, um, there've been two main sources of this racism and two main impacts. The first source of the um, racism is a perpetual foreigner stereotyping uh, that Chinese and Asians don't belong, we're unassumable, we're disease ridden, um, and we're, because we're Orientals, we're exotic and different. Because of that stereotype that we're outsiders who don't belong, we see this current surge of racism today. And as an example, we have Bawi Kung and his son who were slashed in Texas because they were seen to be Chinese and to have brought COVID-19. Bawi isn't even um, Chinese, but he's a refugee from Burma. And yet he is perceived as being Chinese as an outsider with the disease and therefore to be excluded like um, Professor Wong, not even excluded, but the policy of extermination. So they tried to kill him. So this perpetual foreigner stereotype is one source of racism that we're, we as Asians are seen as outsiders who don't belong. The second source of racism that we're seeing today that we've been talking about in this series is how US-China relations um, and how China is perceived as a nation um, has <clears throat> led to institutionalized exclusionary policies um, even today. An example is Professor um, uh, Chen here who is an MIT professor and arrested for um, fraud. And so I'll quickly give you the policies that have been um, creating this sort of state of yellow peril and 
having a chilling effect, especially on Chinese scientists first. Um, so what happened to Wen Ho Li, um, being arrested, being suspected as being a spy, happened to Professor Xi Xiao Xing in Temple University. And then um, it continued. And actually that policy of investigating Chinese in particular um, was actually made formal in the Department of Justice China Initiative in 2018. The FBI director, Chris Ray says, no, China, no country presents a broader, more severe threat to our ideas, innovation, and economic security than China. And so it's just named the China Initiative and clearly racially profiles Chinese. It has an overreach effect. Rather than investigating individuals, this policy and its approach and its practice is to investigate Chinese overall and then try to ensnare people within its um, net. Its ostensible goals are to identify trade um, secret theft, um, to have an enforcement strategy concerning non-traditional collectors of um, information. That includes especially researchers and scientists. So they are focusing on researchers and scientists, um, trying to focus on um, trade. They also focus on the university level. And so given these goals and given this fear, this yellow peril fear, um, the FBI has been surveilling um, Chinese Americans in particular, throwing a wide net looking for um, theft or um, both of um, technology or um, weaponry. Unfortunately, What's happened is that there were a lot of, like Wen Holy, a lot of false positives. They believe these Chinese scientists are um, espionage agents, but the false positive is that they're wrong and they deprive these Chinese Americans of their civil rights, um, ruin actually their finances, ruin their careers, careers, traumatize their families. So Professor Xi Xiaoxing here, again, he was arrested um, and for eight months, um, all charges were dropped. So again, it was a spurious case. It happened to Professor An Ming Hu. Um, they investigated him for two years, surveilled him, and they finally um, they arrest him as uh, for fraud. But again, um, that case gets dismissed in a day. So they're looking for espionage and trade secrets, but they can't find any. So instead they're arresting Chinese scientists for fraud. That's what happened to Professor Xi. That's what happened to Professor Hu. So currently after three years of this type of initiative investigating thousands of Chinese Americans and Chinese researchers, um, this initiative has resulted in only 61 cases and five of them are the ones that deal with actual econ economic espionage. Instead, most of the cases deal with fraud and um, they're, what they're doing is they're catching Chinese uh, on minor um, declaration purposes of how they have to disclose conflict of interest or disclose um, financial information and, and arresting them for that reason. Because they're arresting people for that, um, 85, Chinese have lost their work. Um, again, they were innocent. These are minor infractions, yet they're losing their careers and their work. Um, and again, that type of um, policy has led to a really ch a real chilling effect on the um, scientific community. In fact, um, again, these cases are really spurious. There's a clear overreach of the Justice Department and they actually dropped five cases. They've arrested them, yet had to drop them because they don't have any real evidence. So this is a concrete case of institutionalized racial profiling. It's in the name. The Department of Justice is um, employing the China Initiative to surveil Chinese scientists and researchers to arrest them on minor charges, oftentimes trumped up charges. And it's again, um, leading to the loss of civil rights um, and the careers of these Chinese scientists. At the same time, we know that the political rhetoric um, not only has been institutionalized, but it's um, bashing China, um, like Judge Singh says, has led to the bashing of Chinese people and those who look Chinese. So we at Stop AAPI Hate have received over 9,000 incidents of racism in the past year. And um, it's clearly 
our numbers are just a fraction of what's happening. Um, the Pew Research Center said 45% of Asian Americans have experienced racism um, in the last year during COVID-19. So I'll wrap up here. It's clear the yellow peril um, threat has been operationalized and institutionalized yet again. History has repeated itself, both in governmental policies and in the interpersonal violence that Asian Americans are facing at the moment. Um, fortunately, um, to wrap up, history is repeating itself in that we've learned from history, we as Asian Americans, and we know that in every instance of discrimination, Asians have always fought back, right? We fought back during Chinese exclusion and engaged in civil disobedience. We fought for um, redress and reparations after Japanese American incarcerations. Um, we fought against 9-11 um, detentions and deportations. And today, I really see the Asian American community really learning from um, the Third World Liberation Front and the San Francisco State Strike, learning from um, what we've done at the I Hotel and uh, with uh, Lyle versus Nichols, working and building institutions like CAA. So um, having that organizational background um, network, having a knowledge of our history, we've been really able to mobilize at this moment. So I could talk more about that, but thanks. Thank you, Professor Zhang, very much for being able to uh, summarize so quickly all these important factors that are uh, happening today. Um, nobody mentioned about the Vincent Chin case. So I'm gonna take the prerogative of the moderator and just briefly mention that he was killed, murdered by two white men because they think he was, he was a Japanese who was responsible for the auto industry problem and the economy. But what I really want to tell you is that judge who sentenced him only sentenced him to no time, but only the defendants were only to pay $3,000 in damages, not to him, but and served three years probation. I want to say that because I want to bring into the present time when one of my colleagues, actually on the Santa Clara Superior Court, I, I work with him, I know him, G Judge Aaron Persky, was actually recalled by the public because he was he sentenced Brock Turner to only six months for raping a Stanford student. But what I want to bring into the focus is that the community's reaction today was to get together, campaign against somebody that they feel was not correct in the sentencing, and yet Vincent Chin's sentence for 3,000 license to kill was really never really dealt with politically. So that's a disparity of what's happening today from the past. And I think we need to mobilize our efforts and become more active and more action oriented. Now I'm gonna to turn to the questions from the audience and see what questions we have. There's one excellent question. You know, a lot of what we learned today is from the media. And what we hear is from the media, it shapes our minds, it shapes our things, it shapes policies in the country. So one of the viewers asked this question, how do we hold the media accountable for the misinformation and demonization of China. Dr. J uh, uh, would you like to pr proceed? Professor. <laughs> yeah, Professor Jim. Okay. Um, yeah, holding the media accountable um, for how they um, write about or represent China is really key. And so, um, the Asian Pacific American Congressional Caucus, they actually created and sent out guidelines of how both elected officials and the media should talk about China during this period of the US-China Cold War. And this is what we recommended to at Stop API Hate. Instead of uh, making bl blanket generalizations about China and the Chinese people, instead, if they are going to critique China, they have to critique it in terms of specific policies like the Chinese government's policy regarding this is inappropriate for these reasons. So specificity is really important because again, people don't make the distinction between China, Chinese government with Chinese culture and Chinese people and Chinese Americans. And so being clear on those distinctions, I think helps at least temper the backlash against China. 
the other thing that we've actually called for is to um, balance um, any criticism with China with an expression of peace, of friendship, of concern for um, Chinese people and its citizenry. And so that's really key, right? Again, we don't want to create hostility between peoples, although we may want to challenge particular policies. And then the other recommendation we, we wanted them to um, hold to us that if they are again, if they're going to China, they should always again temper that with saying, but we do not condone racism and a backlash against Asian Americans. So um, we've been trying to um, encourage media to have a better representation of both China um, in light of the current surge of racism. Thank you. I'm going to now turn to Professor Ling Chi Wang to comment on that question as well, because I remember way back in the early 70s, 60s, when we formed Chinese for Affirmative Action, one of the committees was media committee to see how the media can be more sensitive and cover Asian American issues in a more balanced fashion. Professor Wang, would you like to address the issues? How can we get the media accountable for the misinformation and demonization of China? By the way- Well, that's a very, very important question that you had just asked. Because, um, you know, on the eve of President Nixon's visit to Beijing in 1971, CBS News aired a one and a half hour long documentary called Misunderstanding China, essentially to talk about how our public and our government has been largely misled by a lot of racial prejudice misinformation, fake information, and, uh, and how unprepared America was at that time to deal with a, a modern China, a China that's different from our you know, racist stereotypes. And uh, it is very important that the uh, you know, American be educated, for instance, you know, how many Americans know that China now has more than 2 billion doses administered against the coronavirus? Uh, how many Americans know that out of 1.4 billion people in China, less than 3,000 people, about 5,000 people have died from the, uh, from, from the virus? And uh, why don't we know? You know, this is very un unusual that the, uh, you know, and I think that really it has something to do with our racial prejudice. It has something to do with our, our unwillingness and inability to admit, yes, there are other countries besides us that is number one in the world. And that, you know, and that really bothers me because we're always caught by surprise and, uh, you know, China has uh, vaccines working all over the world, uh, a lot, far more than America have been distributing throughout the world. And, and yet Americans are not being informed about that. Now, why are we doing this? I mean, why institutions such as the New York Times, Washington Post consistently try to keep American ignorant? And that really is very scary because we are essentially allowing the government to manipulate the media and the, 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 the uh, dissemination of information. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we needed the public to go to support the policy that we are now going after China. That policy can only be supported if we have nothing but negative news about China and negative news about Chinese. And so we are actually the collateral damage of not only very proactive anti-China policy, but also by omission, you know, misinforming uh, public about what is going on. So I think the media really needs to think about what their role is in our society, because it is rather alarming that, yes. that we don't hear these things. I think this is why a program like this is so important. If the mainstream media doesn't cover these issues, 
we have to try to get our messages to the world in terms of having programs like this and also maybe having to create our own uh, our own news our own put together our own information you know social media is so important these days a lot of people don't read washington post anymore social media youtube reach more people young people than the major um, you know press media type so we need to use these alternative ways of communicating to the public about what real news is about Chinese Americans, China, US policies and so forth. So I think we are almost running out of time, but I'd like to conclude by saying this topic that we talk about today, I hope will reach across the board to the government and maybe we can influence public opinion on China, on US-China relationship. And this is one step towards peace and not war. So is there anything else you would like to conclude, Professor Zhang? Uh, no, I'd just like to thank the organizers again. It's clear um, US-China relations, American foreign policy translates into the domestic status of Asian Americans racially. And so foreign policy has a direct relationship to our um, racial status. And so we need to continue this type of conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. How about you, Professor Wang? Is there any no, one I think word advice you want to give? I said too much already. <laughs> no, you were excellent. Both of you were excellent. Thank you so much on behalf of this program. Thank you. And Don Tao, thank you very much for hosting this. Ling Chi, Russell, and Lillian, uh, I want to thank you very much for leading us to relive this part of history even though it's very painful to relive it. But in doing so, if, but if doing so can help others as well as us to understand that the injustices inflicted on Chinese Americans during the last two centuries are un-American and contrary to what this country is supposed to stand for and what this country wants to be. We want to emphasize that standing up for our rights is the true spirit of American democracy. And that stopping such fabricated demonization of China is what true Americans should do and should be applauded for doing so. In the last minute, I just want to show you what's coming next week and also the following five seminars after next week. So I want to show you one screen. Can you see my screen, upcoming webinars? Yes. Okay. Next week, we're going to start two sessions on modern Chinese history. So next week and the following week, Professor Ken Hammond will speak on modern Chinese history. Next week is on the 19th century and the following week, is on the 20th century. And then on October 27th, Julie Tang will talk, give a talk on Hong Kong and I'll give a talk on Xinjiang. And then the following two weeks after that, George Ku will talk about US-China relationship, first the 19th century and then the 20th and 21st centuries. And he will, this, in the second talk, he will discuss the Chinese the United States foreign policy toward China of the last three US presidents. And November 17, we will end our webinar series with a talk by Sheila Xiao, who will speak on China is not US enemy. Before I finish, I want to let you know that um, we record all these webinars and the recordings the video recording will be made available in YouTube and also the audio simulcast uh, uh, podcast will be made available. Usually they will be made available before the next webinar and they will be announced. Uh, they'll be sent to all the registrants and it will be also 
be listed in the Coalition Peace Initiative website. I believe that website where you can find these replays has already been posted in tonight's chat box. So I just want to thank all the speakers, especially Russell, Ling Chi, and Lillian as the moderator and the audience for participating. And we, I hope that you all come back next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.